going to say. Thank you. I think that's the signal. Okay. Okay, well, I will start us off by saying uh, good morning or, or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from in the country, uh, and welcome. My name is Russ White. I am the Director General of the Prediction Services at the Meteorological Service of Canada. I'm pleased to welcome you today to this third session of the 150th Symposium on Weather Services, which I will be co-chairing together with my esteemed colleague, Ken McDonald. This session will focus on the service dimension of the weather enterprise. We'll explore past and future, direction, future directions of how weather services are delivered in Canada. The range of topics we could explore is broad, so we'll be focusing on a few specific areas. We'll start today with a historical perspective, looking back at the origins of weather services in Canada and how they've evolved over the past 150 years to where they are today. We'll then look at the services of today, uh, the future trends, and how service needs are evolving from three perspectives that we feel represent the coalition that addresses weather risk in Canada from a service perspective. Uh, the first perspective is that of NSC as the National Meteorology Organization. Uh, the second is the important perspective of specialized users of weather services, mainly the emergency management community, with representatives from Calgary and Nova Scotia, and the final perspective will be that of the private sector, represented in this case by the, uh, by the weather network. So I'll turn it to you, Ken, to start with the introduction of the panelists. Thanks, Russ. Uh, so for the topic, we have five illustrious speakers for the session today. Uh, at least I hope we have five. We're, we're one short right now, but we hope to have five in a few minutes. Uh, the historical perspective will be presented by uh, none other than the legendary David Phillips, ECC senior climatologist, unofficial historian, and man who, who needs very little introduction. He's been with the Weather Service over 52 years, so that's he's had first-hand experience with over a third of our 150 years history. His many publications, including a book on the book on the climates of Canada and two bestsellers, "The Day Niagara Falls Ran Dry" and "Blame It on the Weather." He was the originator and author of the, the best-selling Canadian weather trivia calendar. He's the recipient of many awards, and he was named to the Order of Canada back in 2001. Thanks, Ken. Uh, next up will be our very own Dennis Dudley from the Meteorological Service of Canada, who represents some of the MSD thinking on service directions. Dennis has over 30 years of experience with MSC. He first joined in, in the, as a summer student at the Alberta Weather Center. He was there on Black Friday, which was July the 31st, 1987, when the second most deadly tornado in Canadian history moved to Edmonton, which clearly made an impression on Dennis's career. Dennis Kirk's work is focused on the evolution of future services in MSC and on a new operational framework to deliver those decision support services to Canadians. And then following Dennis, we'll hear from two colleagues from the emergency management community. First up will be Paul Mason, who's currently the executive director of the Nova Scotia Emergency Management Office. And this is a position he's been in since 2017. Uh, previously, he was the director of emergency services, where he provided leadership and direction for Nova Scotia's 911 system. And prior to joining the public service, Paul worked with financial sector and banking and insurance. He was born and educated in Nova Scotia, holds a master's of uh, business administration from St. Mary's University in Halifax. Then we'll move across the country and to hear about emergency management from a municipal perspective. Uh, Sue Henry is a 20 year veteran of the city of Calgary and became the chief of the Calgary Emergency Management Agency last year. Uh, prior to this role, Sue was the deputy chief. Uh, she played a key leadership role in the 2013 Southern Alberta floods uh, the wildfires at Fort McMurray, Slave Lake, and she's been supporting the city's uh, response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Before her time with uh, CEMA, she Henry was a firefighter with the Calgary Fire Department, and she holds a Master of Science in Emergency Management from Jacksonville State University. She received the Medal of Honor for her role in the 2011 Slave Lake wildfires. Thanks, Kim. Uh, and then finally, we'll switch our attention to the broadcasting sector of the weather enterprise and hear from Chris Scott. Chris is the head of meteorology at Pelmarx Corporation, which is the, the parent company of the Weather Network and Nick Media. 
Chris began his career at Pellworks as an operations forecaster and as an online meteorologist. Currently, he's part of the senior management team and leads a group of 25 operation and research forecasters focused on providing best in class weather forecast data. Chris holds degrees in atmospheric science from both the University of Michigan and from York University. So those are our panelists. Um, we hope to have some time after we've seen the presentations to have some questions. So please feel free to use the, the chat function if you wish to submit questions. We will be monitoring as we go through. So I'll turn over to you, Kim, to get us going. So we'll get started right away. And as Russ said, uh, we'll start with historical perspective from none other than David Phillips. So David, uh, over to you and share your screen. Okay, um, well, thank you so much, uh, Ken and Russ. Now, let me just be sure here, is, is everything copacetic with my slides? Uh, no. And keep you good. Looks thank great. You so okay. Well, my task is, I think, somewhat daunting today. I've got to cover 150 years of weather history and 20 minutes or, or more from a guy who's as Ken said, is starting his uh, second half century in the business and someone who's got 33,000 weather stories. You know, historians have connected the beginning of National Weather Services to the high incidence of, of storms on the high seas in the, in the 1860s. In North America, uh, scientists and politicians were horrified by the loss of life on the Great Lakes and in the uh, Atlantic coastal uh, waters. And it was said that the average life expectancy of a, of a young sailor stepping a foot on the deck of a Great Lake ship was, was five to seven years. And so the primary mission, of course, of the National Weather Services in Canada and the United States was to provide storm warnings to mariners to, and their passengers, to shippers and, uh, and, and fishermen. Uh, a month after the first Canadian produced storm warning came into effect, the public weather forecasting began. And they were called probabilities or opinions. And they were issued by, by not meteorologists, by people called old probs. Gosh, I often wonder what they called climatologists back then. So every, every day at, uh, uh, from Toronto at 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, the forecast was issued every day except Sundays. I guess they didn't have weather on on Sundays, and, and it, was, um, it, it was good for the following uh, 24 hours. I think one of the most uh, remarkable um, stories of, uh, of Canadian weather history, but, but really Canadian history, uh, is the effect, uh, the effort of trying to get the weather word out quickly and, uh, and widely. You know, every forecaster knows that getting the Getting the most accurate and timely weather forecast is useless unless you get to the hands of somebody that can make value of it, uh, either save life or property or, um, you know, make life comfortable or, or create increased profits for, for various enterprises. Now, in the beginning, the uh, first forecasts were posted in framed bulletin boards outside post offices, railway stations, and crowds would come down there to, uh, to read the forecast. You could also, in large cities, you could mail the forecast. Believe it or not, you can mail something at 10 o'clock in the morning and get it by two o'clock in the afternoon. Now, I don't think we could even mail seasonal forecasts and get them on time. Uh, we also found telephone operators would re re sort of memorize the forecast in the morning and then would recite it to any party line that would be willing to listen to it. And that's how forecasts spread out to rural areas and farm communities and, and isolated uh, areas. Um, one of the more ingenious ways of, of sending the forecast out was by, by passenger train. Uh, the morning forecast was telegraphed to the railway uh, agent. He would post um, a large one meter uh, steel disc on either the baggage car or the, or the front of the locomotive. And if the train traveled from Windsor, Ontario to Windsor, Nova Scotia, anybody within view of the train could see it. And so um, a large full moon meant a sunny day uh, whereas NG, like you see here on this locomotive, meant not good. So weather services um, uh, uh, spread rapidly across the country to all regions. I mean, Alberta and Saskatchewan had weather services for 15 years before they joined Confederation. But for the first half century, weather services pretty well stayed the same. There wasn't really very much uh, improvement. I think another observation 
um, is that hand in hand to the growth and delivery of weather services in Canada has been development of communications technology. I mean, telecommunications helped to transform meteorology from a interesting to a practical everyday science. And furthermore, society's basic essential um, uh, right to know the weather was one of the reasons why communication devices were developed in the first place. One such example was the, in the 1920s was radio telegraphy, which essentially allowed teletype to replace the Morris code. Uh, wireless telegraphy re revolutionized meteorology almost as much as the telegraph did 75 years prior to that. It was now possible to collect real-time weather data from um, remote sites like the Arctic, from ships, from uh, logging camps, and, and then return the, uh, the product, uh, reciprocate the, pro uh, the, the observation with, with weather uh, uh, services. Um, I think the explosive uh, growth of, of, of computers, uh, computer technology, made the possibility of more and more better weather services in real time to more users wherever they were with just the, the touch of a, of a keyboard. And, and computers really took the, the drudgery out of uh, the routine work out of meteorology to allow professionals to do more work on sciences and, and services. And you have to be impressed with the, the, the rapid speed and storage increases that we've seen in the in the computer. I remember back in the 70s when CMC got the first the supercomputer and, and how excited people were then. Well, the supercomputers today are 78 million times faster than those supercomputers in the 1970s. So since the year 2000, the number of ways that the public can receive weather services has really exploded with the internet and, and apps and uh, um, uh, websites and alerting push technology. Canadians are more likely to get the weather from the internet than from sort of traditional mass media uh, methods. Today, there is not a single Canadian, whether it be an Inuit on, in a hunter in Iguglik or a, a canola farmer in Saskatchewan or a hearing impaired child in Bridgewater that is not without access to the, uh, to the weather. I think another reason uh, for the longevity and the success of, of the weather enterprise in the country is that We've always been willing to accept or, or adapt, or as, as uh, Lieutenant Governor Liz Dodswell said just an hour ago, that ability to, uh, to be agile and receptive to accepting new challenges before we had to. Uh, it's almost like the idea that we shed some services and, and accept uh, uh, new ones. Our role has always been tracking the weather, but in the early years, we were also the go to service for, uh, for seismology, for uh, astronomy, for magnetism, uh, for tidal and hydrographic surveys. And we're also the time service in, uh, in Canada. Today, our interests are, you know, air quality and stratospheric ozone and sea state and, and ice surveillance and forecasts, the water surveys and monitoring, uh, emergency response and, and environmental prediction. I think another is sort of enduring strength of the weather enterprise has been the willingness to to broaden the range and scope to accept a, and take on a host of value added services and applications tailored to specific users and, and uses. You know, in the first half century, the focus was on establishing networks, on, on instrumentation, on learning about the science of meteorology and, and trying to improve the, uh, the forecasts. The 1930s saw a really an explosive uh, time for, for meteorology in Canada. I mean, not only in Canada, but around the world, because of aviation, the invention of the, of the airplane, and that very close, compelling connection between meteorology and, and aviation was, was so critical in the expansion of this kind of, uh, of service. I mean, the very first operational forecast uh, for aviation in Canada was to support the R-100 airship, the dirigible, sort of like the uh, Hindenburg or the Zeppelin that came to Canada in July of 1930. And a little small office at 315 Bloor Street was this little ad hoc um, group of four or five meteorologists that worked around the clock to schedule the route of the airship from west of Iceland to Canada and back. But when that airship returned safely, that, that little aviation office absolutely exploded. Because in the next nine years, we saw uh, 
intercity uh, air mail routes. Uh, we saw Trans-Canada Airlines flying for the first uh, time across the country. We saw in 1937-38 became in vogue to, to fly to Europe on, on aircraft. And, and, and of course, then it was also the war years. You know, prior to 1938, there is no communication at all between the Department of National Defense and the Weather Service. And then it actually took off. We saw a weather service that, that grew from, uh, from maybe 10 or 15 professionals to, to uh, uh, 350. Four weather offices to 68 weather offices. And from uh, what we've been in a marine service to now an air services in, in, a, new, um, uh, in a new department. So these were really the, the growth years of meteorology in Canada. Now, after the Second World War came the golden age of applied meteorology. You know, returning officers and, and soldiers, uh, civilians now, they recognized that weather was more than just, you know, today's highs and lows, and it's going to be a wet weekend. They saw applied meteorology could tell you what you could do and what you could not do. And yesterday's stale, spent uh, weather observations were being turned into indispensable and practical information to solve problems and, and make money. And users came from, uh, from, from hydrology and, and storm uh, and flooding, from architects and engineers, from uh, agriculture, from forestry for both insect spraying and forest fires. And, and the fact that it were not crops failing and bridges collapsing every day meant that this planning based on weather information was actually working. But also importantly, then the, the users and uses were coming from the millions of Canadians that were using weather services and could now see that they could become part of, of decision-making other than just taking a, uh, addressing Johnny more warmly or, or, uh, or not going shopping, something like that. I think another attribute and, and quality of the weather enterprise in Canada, especially in the MSC, is how receptive we were to, uh, have been, to consulting new partners and constituents in nearly everything we do, especially in developing new applications. I mean, turning raw data into products and services expressed in the language of the user has been the hallmark of weather enterprises in this country. In the early years, I mean, forecasts and, and warnings were very popular with the intended audience. I mean, shippers and and mariners, they, they loved the forecast. And, and even people who ran exhibits and, and exhibitions uh, and displays, they thought, wow, these weather information was so good to ensure the success of our particular operation. Even wagers on, on horses found a, a real advantage to, uh, to their, their odds in, in by consulting a, a weather forecast. You know, weather meteorologists have never had to cold call. You know, I mean, it's just they wait for somebody to knock on the door and identify a need, uh, not just a want. And, and that's really been the, the, the situation. Even partnerships today, um, I, I, I think is just one example. Uh, I mean, I don't have enough time to go to many, but just the Air Quality Health Index, for example. The way that we, the Environment Canada, the Meteorological Service partnered with the Health Canada, with the provincial agencies and the territories, with uh, provincial governments and territorial governments. It just showed you how the work that went into this to produce uh, what has been a very important and appealing uh, service product uh, that, that we have. Throughout the history, our media, uh, the, the media have been a very good partner and a close partner uh, with, uh, uh, with Canada. Uh, with the meteorological service, uh, you know, within three months of the of the first uh, issuing of the public forecast, newspapers, every newspaper in Eastern Canada carried the forecast. I remember living in Windsor, Ontario, as a kid, and seeing that little piece of little weather up there in the upper right or the upper left corner of the Windsor Daily Star. And uh, newspaper editors didn't like it, but my gosh, they thought it was a fad and it would go away. But boy, the public loved it, and they bought newspapers to cover it. So that availability of weather forecasts in daily newspapers has been an accepted part, an integral part of Canadian life for nearly 150 years. And then of course, you know, the weather uh, 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 radios in the 20s and 30s um, uh, became very important. Is this a way you could update the weather forecast so, uh, so quickly? And, uh, and so it really became uh, uh, again, an accepted part of, um, of life. 
And to show you how crucial weather was during the war years, uh, particularly after Pearl Harbor, it was forbidden to publish and broadcast weather in Canada and the United States. Oh, you could get a special uh, permit to, to maybe issue a forecast or receive a forecast, but generally it was not available. Even, even baseball announcers couldn't say rain delay because it felt that it gave the enemy too much, uh, too much information. And then in 1952, of course, uh, weather was shown in our bedrooms and our living rooms when uh, Percy Saltzman, the very first face on, on Canadian television. Oh, there was Uncle Chicamus and, and Hollyhock. They were two puppets, but then came Percy and for 22 years gave the weather on television along with Rube Hornstein in the, in the Maritimes. I think we've always so fortunate in this country that we had meteorologists and scientists presenting the weather on television, not in the United States where they had, you know, smiling faces and, and puppets and pets and, and clowns that, that, that gave the, uh, the forecast. Then in 1973, we saw weather appeared on local cable television. Oh, was it primitive? Elevator music and static cameras and, and scrolling text. And, but boy, was it effective and was it popular? And then in 1976, weather radio, uh, the first 90% plus Canadians being reached by continuous uh, weather broadcasts. And then in September the 1st, 1988, um, the highly popular and successful weather network. And I'm sure Chris is going to tell us something about the success of that particular enterprise. But I think throughout the history of the weather enterprise in Canada, and particularly the, the, the MSC, uh, has showing a willingness to always decentralize or centralize, to reorganize, to transform itself, to modernize, in order to keep abreast with the kind of, of weather uh, uh, of, uh, growing services. In the first 75 years of the service, everything was issued, forecasts were issued from Victoria or Winnipeg or, or from 315 Bloor Street. And then in 47, we began to regionalize across the country. Marine uh, services were available, were decentralized to various water bodies. They didn't come out of a head office in Toronto. At one time, we had 120 weather offices across the country, manned by 24 hours a day by professional staff. I mean, these people were, were celebrities in their community often on radio and television, uh, were members of the Kiwanis Club, were counselors on school boards. I mean, they were, they were pin pinnacles of their society. Unfortunately, the, that local presence, so in many some locations, just wasn't uh, uh, sustainable. And then of course, we see modernization and reorganization as we sure that we have really had the, the best and most useful weather information and services provided. For example, the Weather Service has always been willing to, to transform and change itself. Uh, 1958, uh, we took on more uh, weather observing, recording, reporting, and forecasting from sea ice, and so important for uh, the Coast Guard and DND. In 1986, the Hurricane Center, uh, kind of a, a, a partner with the, um, with the National Hurricane Center, a, a very important uh, a part of that uh, story in terms of tropical storms in, in Canadian waters. And in 1997, just another example of that like lightning detection network. And, and that be, became part of a, a North American wide network. So we've always been willing to change and, and adapt to, to the circumstances. Now, as a climatologist, I'm sure you didn't expect me to get through this talk without mentioning the word climate once or, or, or twice. In several ways, I think this has been a very important strength of the weather enterprise in Canada. It's the fact, for the most part, we've kept weather and climate together, not like we've seen in other countries. What I've said about weather service could be said about climate services. Uh, in fact, if you change the weather, I mean, you change the climate. And let me illustrate uh, with this kind of last point about the importance of this duality of weather and climate in Canada, and I, and I use the meteorological moment of the of the Saguenay um, uh, of flood uh, back in um, in 19 July of 1996, our first billion dollar weather related uh, uh, disaster, and then two years later came the Eastern Canadian um, ice storm um, that uh, that even today four million Canadians identify it as the uh, the storm of a of a lifetime, and then for the next 22 years. Uh, there was a, been a parade of, of weather disasters, 
I mean, I, I, I know I, I put together every year the top 10 weather stories. And I can tell you for 25 years I've been doing it. And it was a world of difference prior to 96 than it has been since then in terms of, uh, of these anthropogenic enhancement of weather extremes, which has necessitated the transformation of the weather enterprise in Canada. Uh, for MSC, for example, we begin to see, began to see our role as, as not just reporting the weather, but in fact, uh, uh, equally, what will the weather do and, and what we should we do about it, the fallout, the effects of it. Uh, we began to consult more, more directly with, with local governments and emergency management organizations. We established the, the, the Warning Preparedness Meteorologist Program with a, as a direct conduit into EMOs to ensure that communities were better prepared before the event happened, that is through planning and design. And then of course, when the event hit in terms of monitoring and, and operations. As our ADM, uh, uh, Diane Campbell has said, we, we really shifted our focus uh, to a risk-based information for emergency-based management. We've become really more of a, a full impacts-based service. And for in, in, ordinary Canadians, they've never distinguished between weather and climate. And they just see now the fact that these these things that are going in more abundance and more intensity, um, it's the fact they're just not having to wait for it. And uh, uh, decades from now, it's happening. It's sort of the here and now. And, and also I think of, of great significance was the acceptance of the insurance sector. It was pivotal in understanding this, um, uh, this, this connection with, with weather and, and climate. They were convinced that meteorological mayhem was mutating. They had the numbers to prove it. They went to boardrooms in Bay Street and and um, uh, back rooms in, in Ottawa, and they made the case and people listened to them. I'd like to think they were uh, that politi polit polit politicians and, and corporate Canada were listening to research scientists, but, but no, I think it was the, the acceptance of, uh, of the insurance industry, the sector and the importance of this that really resonated in, in among all Canadians, but particularly in the in the corporate and, and political world. So let me say that in conclusion, I think our early visionaries such as George Kingston and, and John Patterson had an idea of a national weather forecasting service funded by government for the benefit of all. They saw a, a clear sense of, of purpose, a simple and enduring and compelling public service but they could never have imagined the, the quality and variety of weather services available to Canadians today, or the sophisticated technology available to weather professionals in Canada. Uh, they could not have envisioned the, the, the kind of viability of the, of the private consulting weather, uh, weather sector, or the around the clock media coverage to feed Canadians passion uh, for the, the weather, or the highly respected academia in Canada in atmospheric sciences or professional organizations like the CMOS. I think the public is better off today, they're safer and more protected than ever before because of the availability of weather services from coast to coast to coast. In such a young country as Canada, I, I think it's extremely unusual to find a scientific endeavor with as much purpose and, and, and history and appeal and, and solid reputation as the meteorological enterprise. And whether you're talking about MSC or TWN or EMO, we've come a, a long way since that very first, you know, posted forecast outside Union Station in Toronto. But our underlying mission and our motivation is today continues as steadfast as it was in the 1870s. That is getting the weather word out for the protection of lives and property and the success for all Canadians. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. That was uh, both entertaining and very great way to set the stage for, for the discussion today about weather services. Now we're gonna hear from Dennis Dudley from the Meteorological Service about where the National Weather Service is and where it's going, Dennis. Okay, thank you, Ken.
Can you see my screen? Okay. Your screen is up, Dennis. Great. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much. Um, this is a this is definitely a pleasure to be here. And David talked about a daunting task. Uh, try following David on a on a meeting like this, and you know what a daunting task looks like. Um, it is a pleasure to be here, and I would describe these 15 slides as a snapshot of our current thinking that will no doubt evolve. Uh, this thinking has been maturing over the past number of years in various places across the organization, and this presentation is really a synthesis of that organizational effort, and I extend credit to all those involved. With that in mind, let's begin with uh, the end in mind. We believe in a future where Canadians are better prepared for high-impact weather and where communities are more resilient to our changing climate. We envision a future where Canadians seek out MSC information because of the user experience and of the insight it provides decision makers. And our purpose is really to leverage the capacity and talent of the entire weather enterprise towards a more resilient society. Service evolution is necessary to meet the evolving demands of our changing world. These drivers are not new. We've, we've seen them before and they seem to be constant forcings that continue to put pressure on our system. Keeping pace is the challenge. What does a weather service look like that is able to keep pace with technology, with increasing user demands? And how do we design a service and production system that are agile, able to respond quickly to the next big disaster? How do we measure our progress? And a fundamental question we ask ourselves quite often is, what does success look like? Here's a photo that caught our attention. Warnings were out well in advance, yet food security, supply lines, transportation, and other critical services struggled post-event. What was the perception of risk by the actors involved? What did they know and about weather risks and, and when did they know it? How did they use this information to influence their decisions or did they? We need to engage this entire weather enterprise, all aspects of the information value chain from modeling to last mile decision makers to really understand what went well, what needs to change and where we need to invest in order to reduce these kinds of impacts in the future. Fortunately, the broader meteorologic community has been working on these kinds of issues for many years. Studies of other high impact weather events have demonstrated how impact-based decision-making support service because it can improve community resilience. This is why the WMO and other major hydrometeorological services have taken steps to move in this direction. Closer to home, the MSC has been moving along a similar path toward impact-based decision support for many years. It's taken different names and forms, but the essence has always been in the recognition that strong relationship with key partners serving targeted needs with fit-for-purpose products really lead to better outcomes and a more engaged workforce. These are the fundamentals we intend to build upon. We recognize the further, to, to further explore the man machine mix will be critical. That balance between automation and human value add is another conversation we hear about almost in every circle across the organization. Going forward, our service will need to be underpinned by the best blended ensemble models providing a near continuous update cycle of effective weather element solutions with uncertainty and range baked in. We see artificial intelligence and machine learning being used to really link weather and impacts. Ultimately, the intention is to apply this rich predictive capacity to well-designed impact-based products that are tuned to specific user decision-making needs. And on the human side of the house, people build relationships. That's the foundation of our evolution. Our people will be working in a multidisciplinary fashion, collaborating with experts inside and outside of the organization to solve problems, both tactical and uh, strategic. Our meteorologists will be spending less time on routine forecast production and more time working with partners on emerging risks. It's people that bring life and insight to data. It's people that add credibility to our message and give us our authoritative voice. As tools and technology advance, we will be able to evolve forecast operations. We see operations evolving from routine forecast and warning production to dynamically responding to emergency, emerging risks. 
from issuing warnings based on fixed thresholds to an evolution toward a continuum of impact-based messaging that express risk and uncertainty. From fo fo focusing on a, a primarily public audience to a deeper engagement of public authorities and decision makers that through their actions can actually reduce the size of disaster. From a focus primarily at short range to expanding to seasonal and sub-seasonal timescales, from disseminating meteorology facts and figures to conveying a range of possibility about risks and impacts. And from thinking that success is a good forecast to thinking that success is a good decision. In order to evolve in this direction, a number of themes were identified as critical pillars on our path. Firstly, our journey begins and ends with our people. To quote a colleague, it's all about the people, people. Our staff have a strong sense of purpose and are proud of what they do and for good reason. They have continued to come into the office day and night during this pandemic without hesitation. In spite of fears and uncertainty, they continue to deliver the services critical to our partners and in doing so, further cement trusted relationships. It seems the engrams of passionate and dedicated service get passed down to each successive generation and I expect this will continue into the future. And this is the kind of energy we need to fuel our evolution. All of this to say that staff will have a big role in shaping our path forward. The second thematic area of focus is, is getting the design of future services moving in the right direction. This will require diving deep with our partners, learning about their evolving needs and, de and designing services so that they integrate that, that automation with that human value add. This will evolve as user demands and technology evolves. The third theme is all about leveraging technology, ensuring that meteorologists have the decision support tools on the desk they need to not only assess risks effectively, but also have the tools to communicate risks in a way that integrates social and behavioral science into the message. And finally, we will need to evolve our production system to deliver impact-based support services. To that end, this evolution will require a new workflow in our operational centers. One that is realigned with modern designs of effective risk assessment and communication practices. This is from a 2018 WMO publication on the multi-hazard early warning system. It is designed to reduce impacts by looking at all stages of the information value chain. Ultimately, it requires effective collaboration from all actors within the weather enterprise to enhance the security of our food, water, energy, and other critical parts of our resilient society. We have adapted this approach for our context in MSC. It integrates our experience and best practices over the past 20 years. It's designed to deliver effective decision support and last mile services that includes an evaluation stage for continuous improvement of our service and of our internal processes. It's really a three-stage design. The first stage is about the risk assessment. It combines our meteorological expertise with the expertise from our core partners to co-create an overall picture of weather related, related risks on any given day. The second stage is communicating and service delivery. This is where we communicate those risks to a broad range of audiences from individual Canadians to advanced and sophisticated decision makers. The public audience will see a continuum of impact-based messaging from early heads up to all channel alerts while our core partners will receive tailored decision support services. Finally, as I mentioned, the third stage is an evaluation stage where we critically will look at our performance in order to improve the internal processes and improve our services to clients. So who are these clients? There's a wide spectrum of decision makers that are evolving, becoming more sophisticated, as I mentioned, from individual Canadians to public authorities, to the media, to the private sector, large and small. A big part of our success going forward will be to further strengthen these relationships with these sectors, with these public authorities, with these EMO folks uh, with whom we share a public safety mandate. This is where we see evolving toward a multidisciplinary approach whereby subject matter experts are working together to identify these risks and to develop consistent impact-based messaging. We view this as a shared mission. In terms of future services, these will evolve with our ability to take advantage of technology. For example, we envision serving individual Canadians with high resolution geospatial site-specific information 
it will be a blend of automation and, and human value add. More advanced machine to machine digital data services will supply economic sectors and distributors using APIs and geospatial web services. And it's more than weather data. Earlier this week, during the second session of the MSE symposium, we heard from CCMEP that talked about their vision of a fully integrated modeling system that includes biological, chemical, and other critical data to, to maximize the use of our rich, our rich predictive capacity. And for public authorities, we will evolve with them and further build a service that ante anticipates their needs and helps them achieve their success. So to summarize, we see an evolution from primarily producing weather forecasts to a service that is centered on decision support. The foundation will be pinned on impact-based messaging for the public, location-based, easy to access, easy to understand, yet very relevant. Increase engagement and tailored services as we move up the pyramid towards our distributors, economic sectors, and public authorities. Together, we'll build a more resilient society. Finally, I'll leave you with this image from 50 years ago. Progress feels slow while you're in it, but looking back, you can appreciate how far you've come. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Dennis. That was, that was excellent. And uh, it's a perfect segue from, from what you were saying about uh, who we're trying to serve to go in and talk to uh, and hear from a few of, of the, the, the key partners that you mentioned. Uh, starting with uh, uh, Paul Mason, uh, Paul with Emergency Management in Nova Scotia, and uh, very familiar with, uh, with our services and, uh, and familiar with uh, dealing with disastrous weather too. Over to you, Paul. Great, thank you. Let me just bring up my presentation here. Okay, thanks everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, present today and give an overview of our, our operations uh, here in Nova Scotia. I'm Executive Director of the Provincial Emergency Management Office, uh, Paul Mason. So I'll just speak a little bit about uh, some of the work we do with emergency management and how we collaborate uh, with our partners uh, in the weather field uh, to assist in our both our preparations and our responses to various events. So start off with a little bit about emergency management. So really our, our purpose, very similar to some of the, the speakers who preceded me, is really uh, to preserve life, environment, property, and, and public safety really generally. And how we really look to do that from uh, really the perspective of emergency management is it's generally broken into, into four pillars. And this is common throughout Canada, the United States, and certainly most of the Western countries. Uh, really the first phase is around prevention mitigation. So measures that we can take as emergency managers to help eliminate or reduce risks. So we'll work with many of our partners in these areas to identify these risks and see how, how they can be most effectively uh, mitigated. And of course, uh, when it comes to meteorology and weather is certainly a, a key player in that. Uh, preparedness, uh, looking at planning, training, exercising, and kind of a lessons learned perspective so we can continuously improve from various scenarios and events that, uh, that we uh, partake in as emergency managers. Response. Uh, in Canada and the US, uh, generally response is, it's really a calibrated uh, kind of uh, approach to things. There's the local level, really starting with the individual, where we talk with 72 hours of preparedness and what have you, that'll flow up to municipal partners, provincial uh, emergency management uh, entities such as EMO Nova Scotia, and finally our federal partners at Public Safety Canada, uh, within Environment Canada and other, and other entities. And then finally, there's the recovery phase. Uh, where you look at the events and look to kind of mitigate some of the impacts. Uh, we utilize a federal program, Disaster Financial Assistance, uh, in partnership with Public Safety Canada quite a bit in that area, but it can be more broad than that. We work with other entities such as the Red Cross and what have you to help, help people get back on the feet after uh, some of the unfortunate events that sometimes uh, manifest themselves. So really our role here in Nova Scotia at uh, EMO is really to plan for and coordinate and evaluate the provincial response to emergencies, working with our municipal partners as I touched on earlier, and obviously our federal partners as well. Uh, we take an all hazards approach to that here at EMO. Uh, there's many different types of, uh, of risks and entities uh, that can uh, cause events that we may need to respond to. 
weather is probably the largest of those, but it was interesting in one of the presentations proceeding, uh, looking at the, the large snowfall they had in St. John's uh, back in January of 2020, and there was a lineup outside the Sobe. So critical infrastructure is uh, one of our key areas as well. And it's interesting to see how weather events can impact supply chains. Many private sector entities are driven by just-in-time delivery and these types of things that make sense and are effective from a commercial perspective. But when you get disruptions, whether they be weather related or otherwise within those supply chains, they can have significant impacts. So that's something that we work with our partners to try to manage. And some of those partners are really municipalities, provincial and federal governments, uh, NGOs I touched on earlier, uh, such as the Red Cross and others, uh, our critical infrastructure partners. Uh, they're generally divided into 10 kind of categories and other stakeholders. So when we get into weather, weather is probably one of our key risks, probably the biggest single driver of risk here in our province in Nova Scotia. As I'm sure everyone's familiar, we're kind of somewhat precariously perched on the eastern coast of Canada, and uh, we are prone to have a lot of weather-related events. And where we're, uh, where we're so close to the ocean, uh, that, that introduces a lot of variability uh, into the types of weather events we can get. Uh, you know, obviously hurricanes are something we watch very closely in partnership with the Hurricane Center. But even beyond that, uh, you know, in the winter and fall, uh, you can get a lot of systems that could turn into be a snow situation that has its own kind of uh, impacts from a CI critical infrastructure perspective and others. It can very easily change really within a matter of 12 hours from being a primarily a snow event to uh, a rain or a freezing rain event, which of course can also have significant implications on infrastructure. So weather is something that we are, are pretty much watching uh, on an ongoing basis. Uh, one thing we've seen a lot of uh, more recently as well is, is kind of drought kind of scenarios. And we've seen this from a climate change perspective really manifesting itself, particularly I would say just in the last five or six years uh, in the southwestern portions of the province, uh, you know, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, individual homeowners, what have you, that didn't have a lot of issues from, uh, you know, their well and their own personal water supply are now running into issues more summers than not. So we'll work with our municipal partners to help support those people. But it's a good example of how, you know, a weather kind of issue that was not much of a problem in the past because of climate change has become more of a problem uh, that we're dealing with on a regular basis. So who we partner with around, uh, the, uh, the weather services. It's really to plan for potential system impacts. It assists with our operational readiness and recovery efforts, helps us with decision makings, how to respond and what have you to events which may be coming our way. Uh, when it comes to our provincial coordination center, which is the facility that we utilize as a province to manage our response out of, uh, you know, that, uh, that facility is not at a full activation at all times. So we have established triggers that will help us determine when when the time is appropriate to bring that facility online and to what degree. And, you know, from a weather perspective, uh, looking at things like precipitation, timelines, wind speeds, uh, the types of weather that we'll see, all those factor into uh, the various triggers we utilize when it comes to activating that asset. Also, it helps us a lot with updating our municipal uh, partners and also other entities that we work with. And with also our planning and, and development. So for example, here in Nova Scotia, Canso Causeway connects us to uh, the Cape Breton Island. So we utilize that to kind of model different kinds of events which could occur and how we would respond as emergency managers. So some of the responses that we've seen here in Nova Scotia, and these are great examples of, uh, of really climate change at play. I can say during my 10 years at EMO, and certainly my three years here in, in this position, we have without a doubt seen a definitive change in the weather. Uh, you know, we are getting more frequent storms. We are getting them uh, to be of greater strength than we've seen in the past, uh, you know, and it's definitely having its impact. So whether it be wildfires, uh, obviously Hurricane Dorian in 2019 uh, was a very powerful system that came in and hit our province. Uh, we kind of got lucky last year. We had Hurricane Teddy, which was very similar to Dorian, but did happen to, to make a turn at the last minute and spare us a full impact. Uh, water shortages, as I touched on earlier. Cape Breton floods uh, up in Sydney, Nova Scotia back in 2016. They had 220 millimeters of rain within about a 12 hour period, which uh, blew out a lot of historical infrastructure, which just not built for that kind of, that kind of weather. 
So uh, once again, the, these types of events are certainly manifesting themselves in our in our day to day uh, life. So just some pictures here of some of the events that we've seen here in Nova Scotia. So in the upper right hand corner, uh, that's a, a shot of Dorian coming in. In the lower right hand, just some fires that we've had outside of the Halifax area during the typically the spring is our peak burning period, uh, similar to other parts of Canada. And on the left, uh, some of the uh, Canadian Armed Forces and Nova Scotia Power uh, people that we worked with during Dorian in 2019 to assist us with the response to that event. Getting back to the weather and the value add of the, the prediction uh, and the support we get from Environment Canada, what have you, when we were looking at that event and we were monitoring it for probably a week and a half, and we were hoping it would go somewhere else, but uh, Bob's the weather forecasts were spot on and it, it came directly into Nova Scotia. But as it got in with to the, within about that 72 to 48 hour uh, period, it allowed us to really get teed up and kind of preposition assets of not only our own organization, but also our partners and how we worked with the federal government. We utilized the request for assistance process to bring in the Canadian Armed Forces in response to that event. And we were able to get out in front and actually submit that request very early in, which allowed the CF to come in and support us well in that event. So it certainly helped us with the response. In Nova Scotia, uh, we have about 500,000 actual customers uh, of the, the utility provider. And when we got up on the morning after Dorian, about 415,000 of them were without power. So we had about 80% of the province out. And you start to see, once again, getting back, getting back to the critical infrastructure side of things, you start to see the secondary impacts of that come on stream very quickly. Hospitals, which are on backup power, fuel terminals, which are out of commission, and then you start to get, you know, supply issues out in the parts of the province in the, the various, uh, you know, gas stations and what have you, and then you'll start to get a run on supply. So uh, the weather, what we worked very hard on in the Dorian event and were fairly successful in was we knew because, because of the hit we took from Dorian, we were dealing with massive power outages. What we wanted to do was be proactive and prevent critical infrastructure supply shortages that resulted from the primary impact. So the weather and having that the ability to pre-position those assets was very helpful in our response to that event. So just a little bit more on the benefits. So site-specific weather reports for localized incidents and responses, a region-specific, so Cape Breton floods is a good example of that the forecast models, which allow us to kind of uh, plan for our triggers with regard to PCC, our Provincial Coordination Center activations and what have you. Short-term forecast helps us a lot with our wildfire response, but also drought planning, those kinds of things. Landfall predictions. Uh, I know there's a couple diagrams or uh, visuals here on the next slide. They'll show uh, our, our watchers here in a moment, but that really helps predict us or helps us uh, plan for hurricanes and the paths those may take very important recently with Teddy and Dorian, and also precipitation uh, status reports and what have you, which, as I noted earlier, gets into uh, droughts and water shortages and what have you. So these are a couple of graphics which Environment Canada shares with us on a fairly regular basis. So on the left, you'll see uh, uh, some indicators of some local communities here in Nova Scotia where there's a good comparison between their average and their actual forecast for a, a period of time. So we'll take that information, we'll share that out with our municipal emergency management partners. We'll share that uh, up the line here within government and that can help with decision-making and preparedness. Uh, on the right-hand side, uh, some models are put together by Environment Canada uh, around uh, storm systems and what have you that have come over uh, our province. This is the one for Dorian. So you can see the track off of Florida and then moving up over our province. So this is shared uh, with the decision-makers in the province when we're both getting ready to and responding to events. Uh, certainly very helpful information. It's really in summary, uh, majority of, of our emergency management day-to-day -day planning and operational responses is, is really driven by weather, as I touched on. The knowledges and services provided by Environment Canada is a key component in us being able to successfully uh, uh, respond to these kinds of events. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to have uh, an Environment uh, Canada staff person here uh, in our office, Bob Robichaud, who does an outstanding job uh, supporting us both here in Nova Scotia, but also our other Atlantic Canadian partners. 
Uh, I've joked with Bob in a few uh, of our events that I'll get such demand for his reports that I have to remind my deputy minister that Bob doesn't actually work for me. And <laughs> I have to ask him nicely to get this stuff and he has many other competing demands for his time, but uh, certainly very helpful to us here. So I certainly like to note that. And uh, that's the presentation for today. Great, uh, thank you so much, Paul. Uh, and definitely you can see the, 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 the comparisons between what, where we're trying to go and, and how you need the information, what, what, what it does for you. Uh, so to get another perspective now uh, from the emergency management community, we're really glad to have uh, Sue Henry join us. So uh, glad you got in, Sue. Uh, I gave a really good introduction for you, but you might have missed it, but, but we're glad you're here. Uh, and uh, this is from the city of Calgary, uh, another part of the country not unfamiliar with uh, the impacts of weather. Over to you, Sue. Wonderful. Thank you. And thank you for your patience. I'm not sure what was happening on the technology side there at the start, uh, but I'm hopeful that you can see the, the presentation before I start. We can. Yes. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. So thanks for having me join you here today. I'm, I'm honored to share a little bit of my experience in working with our weather service partners from the emergency management perspective at the municipal level. And as mentioned, I, I work as the chief of the Calgary Emergency Management Agency. We're called SEMA. And we're the coordinating agency for the City of Calgary's disaster and emergency management activities. This includes coordinating our response when major events impact the city. I'm also one of the commanders for Canada Task Force 2, which is Alberta's disaster response team, as well as, well, as well as one of the six heavy urban search and rescue teams that are across the country. So we're a resource that's used both locally as well as uh, interprovincially. SEMA's role is to coordinate the Municipal Emergency Operations Centre and our main role is to ensure we're working towards common objectives against our priorities of safety, critical infrastructure, protection of, protection of the environment, the economy and cultural heritage for the City of Calgary. And one of our foundational principles is really collaboration. And we base all of our work in this relationships with a network of partners that make up our agency. There's more than 60 different agency members at the Calgary Emergency Management Agency. And this is everything from all city departments to ATCO Gas to this Calgary Zoo. And Environment and Climate Change Canada is, is one of our absolutely critical partners in this. I can't think of a single disaster risk in Calgary that's not directly impacted by the weather or that doesn't, the weather doesn't have a compounding impact on when we have an event. So we rely very heavily on our friends in the meteorology service for so much before, during and after uh, emergency events. So it's a real privilege for me to highlight that for you today. If you've ever spent any time in Calgary, you'll know that old cliche of if you don't like the weather, just wait five minutes. And it, it really is true for Calgary. We experience every season in the span of about five minutes, which makes things interesting, but it does present some really unique challenges in terms of severe weather and disasters. In my time with SEMA, we've faced some of Canada's largest and costliest disasters. I think of a couple of the, the big ones for us were the 2013 floods that inundated huge areas of our downtown core and caused about $6 billion of, of insurable damage. I think of snow timber, I think in a city like Calgary, how can a snowstorm be a problem for you? But we went from a 25 degree day to 45 centimeters of snow overnight, and it caused uh, about 500,000 trees to drop every branch and every leaf and leaf. And it destroyed so many trees and had about 100,000 properties without power. And then finally, I think of just recently, we're coming up on the one year anniversary actually in two days from now of our, um, our hailstorm that occurred on June 12th last year where we had tennis ball sized hail impact a small area of the city of Calgary and it resulted in $1.4 billion of damage in a storm that took minutes to go through, through the city. So those are just a few examples of the wild weather that we contend with in, in South Central Alberta and particularly Calgary. Uh, we often argue that we're the disaster capital of Canada. Um, over the last five years, we've accounted for 6.2 billion in insured losses, which is about 60% of all of the, the country's losses have occurred in the Alberta landscape. Emergency management for us is changing. Uh, when I first started, I started as a firefighter at the city of Calgary. 
And we would use weather predictions as a very reactive tool. If we went to a large event and had a big fire, we would call for a forecast and make very, very tactical decisions based on the information that's coming back. This isn't what we do any longer. We're now using these, these weather information and the weather decisions to proactively adjust our plans, to manage the way we schedule events and so many other different expectations. A little bit, um, we focus in Calgary a lot on understanding what our actual disaster risks are. And a lot of our risks are tied and have a weather component to them. So you'll see we did a disaster risk assessment and came up with 14 high risks. And these are all of the events that we focus most of our, our planning effort on from the city perspective. You'll see eight of these are weather related. It's hugely important for us where we work. And one of the key pieces, we have to understand these risks in order to be able to prepare for them. And our, our partners in the weather service were so critical for us to do this assessment and understanding the probability and the impact and ensuring that we were preparing for the right types of events with the right frequency and probability. We rely heavily on um, Environment Canada for all of the different stages. And we'll have heard, uh, when we heard Paul talk, he talked about the different stages of emergency management and our pillars. And we use the, the information from the weather service in every single one of those pillars. So if I think of from a preparedness and prevention lens, this is probably the most important way that we use the information. If we can all work together to stop weather from having a dangerous outcome, I think we've all been successful. And some of the ways that we use this information for preparedness are the incredible forecasting products. We get convective outlook products that come from our weather office, uh, especially in the summer. They come uh, every day to tell us what's going to happen in the next few days. And we actually take those products and adjust our day camps and adjust our summer outdoor programs that if there is a, a high risk day, we'll move that programming inside so we don't have to deal with something occurring on the fly. We also do a lot of education and that's understanding the, the trends in weather, understanding what we can do to be prepared for them. We do this for both the public as well as for our agency members. And that's that, that group of 60 individuals that I referenced before. And it's so critical for those agency members. They then take that information away and they do their plans based on the, the accurate information, the accurate understanding and the accurate ability to focus what little resources some of our agencies have on the highest impact pieces. If I think of the community side, uh, we're launching a program right now called the Best Available Refuge Area, which is a BARA program for us. And that's because of the, the information that we've had from the Weather Service to, to ensure that in the event of a big event in Calgary, we have places for people to go and sheltered locations in, in buildings that they can be safe. I also think of uh, in 2019, the Calgary police um, ran a marathon and they do a half marathon every single year. And in uh, 2019, we got a call out of the blue from the decision support desk um, up in Edmonton for us and gave us a notification that we were about to have a fairly heavy snowfall in the next three or four days, which lined up obviously perfectly with the, the half marathon because that's how it, how it works when you've planned everything. But we actually ended up canceling that marathon as a result of the information that was received. That has a direct impact on, on public safety. We actually saw 82 kilometer hour winds and nearly 20 centimeters of snow, which is exactly what the, the decision support desk had predicted coming. So we actually canceled the marathon. Uh, and it was the first time in history that the Calgary police hadn't, hadn't done that and a direct result of the information from your team if I switch a little bit to the mitigation lens, we all want to build and live in resilient cities. And we use the information about climate change and about weather to help us do structural mitigation, to help us understand how to, how to do flood mitigation properly, what we're actually planning for. And to understand, we get very, very strong storms that come through for such short duration. And if we're constantly working in the same flooded underpass, there's some really great information for us to, to fix that underpass and fix the, the, um, the actual stormwater drainage system below it. If I switch to the response pillar, 
but during an event, we need to be very well coordinated with the folks from the Weather Service. And we ask them to come in and sit directly in the Emergency Operations Centre when we open so that there is no delay of information back and forth. We use the spot forecasting uh, services when there is a smaller event that hasn't opened the Emergency Operations Centre. And there are so many different examples of how the Weather Service has helped us on the, the response side of the equation. I think in the last three weeks alone, we've reached out. We reached out for a grass fire that we were having trouble getting a hold of and got an incredible spot forecast from the decision support desk that was able to, to help the firefighters tactically determine how to stop that fire. And we didn't lose any homes as a result of that. And I, I think some interesting pieces when you think of how to use some of these resources. We were doing vaccinations uh, over this past weekend and we actually used the weather service team to help us do vaccinations because the lineups were going to be outside and because we weren't sure how many folks we were going to have in an area they were critical for us to understanding how to keep people safe and doing some planning for if we did have a severe weather event come through how we could move the folks that that were in the lineup and ironically we ended up having a, an Alberta emergency alert go uh, right in the middle for a tornado alert and because of the work we had done with this team everyone was already prepared and connected and we were able to move move folks to shelter and finally I think of the the recovery pillar um, and thinking about how the the weather service impacts in the recovery pillar and I mentioned the, the 2020 hailstorm that we're coming up to, to an anniversary of. And I think of how differently that storm would have looked if there had been a second storm just on its heels. And if we had only had a couple of hours to, to recover quickly and, and get water moving and get folks inside, would have been very different and much more catastrophic for the city itself. So I think there's a huge role in helping us learn how to, how to recover the people as well as our, our property. So from a municipal perspective, it's, it's critically important that we have the right information and the right partnerships to be able to make informed decisions. My job is to keep Calgarians safe and I, I can't do that without understanding the, the weather and how the weather is going to play a role. If I think of the future, there's so much more work that we can do in these areas and so many other ways that we can partner. If we knew for certainty what was coming at the City of Calgary, we would be able to communicate with the public faster. We would be able to increase safety and in something as simple as understanding that tennis ball sized hail was coming to the city. We could move cars into garages and, and the financial implication on the end of that, there's a, there's a huge impact if we can decrease that damage. I also think of our, our emergency responders and we're asking them to go out in the middle of, of sometimes dangerous storms to take care of public safety. And if we're not coordinated with our weather folks, they give us the go ahead for the storm has passed or the tornado has passed or here's its trajectory. And then we can then release our emergency services into the community. And there's a critical link between doing that in a safe manner that our, our firefighters and our other first responders feel like they're not in, in danger by doing that. And I, I would just want to say thank you. Um, that's the quick version of the municipal perspective. Um, and we're very, very appreciative of the partnership we have with our, our friends in Edmonton and uh, looking forward to doing lots more projects and continuing to move this work forward. So thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Sue. That was, uh, that was a great testimony. I think we may use that for our next uh, Treasury Board request for funding. That was that was fantastic. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, as Russ said at the beginning, there's uh, so many uh, uh, areas we could cover in, in services, but we certainly can't leave out uh, the close partnership and the important role that uh, the private sector plays, and in particular, the weather network and how much that's contributed to weather services uh, in Canada in the last uh, 30 years. So Chris uh, from the weather network. Well, thank you very much, Ken, and I promise to hit this in 12 minutes flat. Uh, so we have eight minutes for uh, questions at the end. All right, so as Russ said off the top, um, I've been asked to give the private sector media perspective. So I wanna do a few things with this presentation. Number one, give you some perspective on the company behind 
the Weather Network and Metsu Media, talk a bit about our history as well as our place within the weather enterprise, some of the trends that we're seeing currently, and then take it forward into challenges as well as opportunities that we're seeing. Okay. So when you hear the Weather Network or Metsu Media, this is probably what you think of. You think of television, websites, and apps. But there's a lot more to it than that. The company behind it is Palmrex. And our headquarters are in Oakville. Uh, we have a significant office in Montreal as well. What you may not know is that we actually operate the uh, most popular consumer weather service in Spain called El Tiempo. We have about 40 people uh, in the Madrid office. Most of you probably know about our involvement within Canada's Alert Ready system. We uh, built the technical backbone and work with a number of stakeholders, uh, including EMOs and MSC on that. And we are positioning ourselves for growth in the B2B space. Uh, most people know us from our business to consumer um, standpoint, but we are looking for growth both in business to business weather services uh, as well as climate, which is a major growing area, as we all know. So I want to position this as uh, trying to tell you a little bit more about how we fit within the weather enterprise. And for those of you who are maybe early career scientists listening to this, I'm guessing that when we throw around the term weather enterprise, you might kind of go, <laughs> what is that? I mean, it's either Star Trek or it's a business, but I don't really get it. One of the analogies I like to use is an ecosystem, because I think we understand with an ecosystem, there are a number of different components that are symbiotic in terms of their relationships to each other. And when one changes, it affects everything. So think of it that way. The weather enterprise can be thought of as an ecosystem. And this is the formal definition. It's the global collection of government, commercial, and academic activity that produces weather and climate information. And this is where you got to forget about the ecosystem analogy for just a second, because this is not like a food chain, okay? A value chain is where you take something at the start and you build upon it. You're progressively adding to that to create more value. That's why it's called a value chain. So we understand in weather that atmospheric science is ostensibly an initial value problem. We've got data, we've got to collect data. You got to do something with it, high performance computing. Uh, generally it's physics based, but increasingly as Dennis was highlighting too, AI uh, is becoming a factor in at least augmenting our predictive capabilities. Then after that, we have value added processing. So, we know that the Navier-Stokes equations aren't analytical in their solutions. We do more things as an enterprise to derive more value from that base data. And then finally, we generate products out of that data. So what do we do at Palmerex? Well, I think Palmerex, like most media companies that are part of the weather enterprise, operate farther down the value chain. We're not doing a lot of the raw data collection, which is significant uh, part of some commercial activity. We're not doing a lot of modeling, but what we do is we add value to that data and we generate products out of that. And I've had the question before, but I think it's a really good one to address. Why wouldn't we just use MSC's data? Like why would a business want to do all this stuff? Well, I'll tell you that businesses do not do this stuff for kicks. Businesses are very cost conscious. So there's got to be a reason behind doing what we do. And there's two main reasons. One is to develop competitive advantage. So we feel that the stuff we do is necessary to make sure that we stand out from the competition. And our competition is Google. It's Apple, the Weather Channel in the US, AccuWeather, a lot of other US players. The second point is that we need to offer a unique value proposition to our users, to consumers. And if you're ever in a discussion with a business person, I guarantee if you throw around the acronym UVP, it's like saying NWP in a group of atmospheric scientists. It's just like, oh yeah, UVP, unique value proposition. It's the thing that businesses have to think about. Why would someone use my product versus someone else's? So that's why we do what we do. And here's some examples of, of what we do. So in value-added processing, we have our own multi-model statistically calibrated forecast system. We're ingesting 
GDPS, GFS, ECMWF, trying to reduce the bias to zero and then blending that together. We also have a forecaster grid editing software uh, system and we are evolving that forward. Uh, Dennis touched on it a little bit. Frankly, I think this is the biggest challenge for any meteorological operation in the world is how to combine the talents of the human with the explosion of data that we're seeing within our science. We believe there is a way to do that. It's really hard, but we're committed to doing that in the next couple of years. We're doing it now, but we just think we need to be better and more efficient to make sure that the human can still influence things, but not letting that get in the way of this great data that's coming at us. And the last one here is uh, now casting. Now casting is kind of the, the no person's land between you know, observations and traditional NWP. So what we did was we developed an approach to assimilate uh, radar data and reflectivity from the NCEP HER model to have a unified now casting approach to try to get precipitation timing more precise. And this is where the rubber meets the road. It's in the products that we produce. Current conditions for any location. I struggled with this one so much when we first started talking about this over 10 years ago. As a meteorologist, it's, it's anathema to say, oh yeah, well, we'll just give you your current condition, but we don't have a weather station there. The thing is people don't care. They don't care if the airport's 30 kilometers away and that's not representative. They just want to know what the current condition is in their backyard. And we've heard talks previously at CMOS that MSC is actually moving in that direction as well. We also downscale our forecast to one kilometer resolution, which is particularly valuable in complex terrain. And tying in with what we do on the now casting side with value added data processing, we have 10 minute precipitation now casts. And we think this is gonna be more important in the future as a value proposition for people using location-based services. So now let's take a step back in time. These are always fun uh, to see how clothing and hairstyles have changed. Um, you know, my experience goes back to the late 90s, but the Weather Network started, uh, as David said, in 1988. The uh, Palmrex became uh, with the Weather Network in the early 90s. And so back in the 90s, it was all about television, television and radio. Um, Palmrex invested in a division that was called New Media. And that New Media was web. And the website, I believe, was launched in 1996. We had hundreds of forecast locations at that time. Then you move into the 2000s. That is a picture of me. I had to put that in just to show that uh, I once did that job. Um, that was when things were exploding. The, the web really took off at that point. We launched uh, the WeatherEye uh, application for mobile. We increased to thousands of forecast locations and hourly and 14 day forecast products were launched. Again, my impression of them at the time, um, I actually said I don't want to endorse these because I was all uh, idealistic about meteorology. I've come to since appreciate that in business, sometimes you need to occupy the space first and improve the product later. And they've since become generally fairly well accepted products um, from, uh, from Met Services. 2010s, this is where mobile consumption really took off. Uh, you can see how our uh, forecast locations have taken off, exponential growth, thousands or hundreds of thousands and now millions of forecasts, current conditions everywhere, 10 minute precipitation now casts. And where we're going in this decade is towards a more screen agnostic cross-platform storytelling approach. So here's the vision. Uh, there's a tornado warning and it's gonna hit the 401. I would love to see us be able to do something where someone in the backseat of a car checks their phone and says, oh, MSC just issued a tornado warning. Oh, Weather Network's live streaming. There's meteorologist Nadine and Tyler, and they are showing me what happened. Here's where the cell is. Here's where it's moving. I'm helping to make that decision based on what I'm seeing. The other component that we have to be aware of is that people want more assistance in what they're doing in terms of a product um, experience. They want more personalizations. So we need to move in that space too, to be more assistive and more personalized in our products. These are some of the key trends. And I would say these are obvious, but I think they're important, especially for this audience to appreciate. Mobile growth, that's happening, we all know that. But the last two I wanna emphasize, because as scientists, we tend to think slowly 
we tend to think carefully. Most people generally want things easy and fast. Our single most popular product is just the current condition. 50% of our users open the app and don't even move from that current condition. That, that just seems ridiculous to me as a meteorologist, but that's what people are doing because they just wanna know, what is it now? I'm gonna make my decision based on that. So uh, I think Andrew Weaver said it very well on the first day of the Congress. He said that science is only as good as our ability to communicate it. And so I would leave you with that thinking, hey, easy and fast. All the science that we do has to get distilled down into something very small. Challenges going forward, I would say our collective ability to quantify forecast probabilities is probably the biggest advancement that we're gonna see. Dennis touched on that, risk, probability. The challenge is how do you get that through, especially to individuals? Uh, we're definitely going to be able to improve automated decision systems, but how do you get that through to individuals when they just want to know, hey, can I go golfing? Will I get my round in today? They want to know if it's going to rain, and sometimes we can't tell them that precise answer. Big opportunity, in, uh, big opportunity in climate change. So we are now engaging more on the storytelling of climate change, more so from the solutions side. We've done some of our own market research and Canadians want to know about solutions. They believe it's happening, they know we're causing it. They want to know more about it. So check us out uh, with our climate offering on Android and soon on iOS. And in five seconds, thank you to MSC and especially thank you to CMOS and its volunteers for making this happen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. And thank you to all of our presenters. Uh, I, I really think you've presented a really rich uh, and diverse view of our weather enterprise, both historically and currently. And I think we're really being able to talk to the scope and, and the depth of the, of the impacts that we have, you know, in terms of the range from supply lines to power supply and that notion of both the safety of the citizens and the, the economic activities. So I think it was a very, very rich series of presentations. We do have a few minutes left for questions. So I'm actually going to pick up on one of the questions I think that, uh, that Chris left dangling there about risk communication. I think we've heard some fantastic examples of, uh, of risk communication, uh, particularly from uh, our colleagues in the, in the EMO and the Emergency Management Organization. Um, I think my question is, is along the lines as, as the trends in forecasting are, are moving towards thinking about forecasting probabilistic terms. With the kind of decisions that emergency management organizations have to take, how, how would it impact your operations and, and your decision-making process when you're receiving information about an event, maybe six or maybe seven days into the future that perhaps only has a, is forecast to have a 20% probability of likelihood? Perhaps I, perhaps I can start with you, Paul. Oh, thanks. Uh, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, as you kind of touched on, I mean, there's the, the, the response side of it and the preparation side, but then there's like thinking of our stakeholders and how a weather event may impact them. Uh, you know, I know certainly at discussions I've had in the emergency management community, uh, you know, food is certainly an area of focus, power another, but fuel is one as well. That is a real critical uh, point of uh, uh, choke point per se in the economy. So at the end of the day, when we can be able to plan and share weather forecasting information with not only for our own purposes, but also with our partners in critical infrastructure and various uh, governmental entities and what have you, that can allow them to, for lack of a better term, kind of prepare or harden their operations uh, to be better positioned for a significant weather event. Uh, you know, that might simply be if you're a, you know, a critical infrastructure provider and you're in uh, you know, an area of the country such as Nova Scotia, where you know, uh, the chances of hurricanes uh, impacting uh, your operations uh, are uptick you know, in that kind of September to November period of, of particular height. Perhaps your, uh, your supply chain, you might build an extra five or 10% into that uh, to kind of harden your operations, be prepared for that. So but it, I guess the short answer is it allows us to prepare and allows us to help our partners be more prepared. Excellent. <clears throat> Thank you, Paul. Sue, so you, you, uh, I'm quoting you from your presentation where you said, if we knew what was coming, we could act. 
So in terms of talking about longer range events and the probability of longer range events, how does that aid you in your university? Incredibly supportive of, of stuff like that. And I think, um, as we just heard, it, it's really about the ability for us to prepare and the us to do some actions. And I think the emergency management is not a, a sexy place to operate and people often forget about it in the side and it, it's not fun unless something is happening. But the, for us, even if we know a week out that there might be something, it gives us that impetus to start the conversation and to work with our different agencies. And I think of, uh, you know, in October, uh, a couple of years ago, we had a, a very early storm season and we didn't know that it was coming. And again, got the heads up that uh, we don't have a lot of confidence, but we think this could be a big storm for you. We actually put the plows back onto the trucks based on that information and we're then ready. We just were ready a couple weeks early, but when the storm came in, we had so much more ability to, to do some of the pieces. It also allows us to to script out some of the communications. You know, a, a snowstorm is not just a snowstorm regardless of the time of year it occurs. Some of the, the nuances are different. So we actually script communications ahead of time. And as I mentioned in the, the chat, we work with any outdoor providers and have them start to think about move your kids' day camps inside and do things differently just in case. So for us, the more warning we can get, the better. So that's, that's really great. Um, Dennis, perhaps I can turn to you. You presented a, a really compelling view of, of the directions that we are pursuing with, within the services side of MSC. And I think there's gratifyingly lots of, lots of alignment with the voices that we're hearing from our partners. What do you think are the biggest challenges we face in, in moving along that pathway in, in supporting emergency management and the media more effectively? Yeah, Chris actually mentioned one just in his, in his talk. It's technology. Leveraging technology is a real challenge. As you know, Russ, I mean, we're, we're, really, we're really dependent on our, on our partners in government to support that mission of, of technology build. And I think that's going to be a real challenge. The other one is capacity, obviously. You know, the, the, the analogy of flying in the airplane, we've got to build a new one while we're doing the, while we're currently flying the, the, the existing one is, is kind of, it kind of makes sense. And, and it's really challenging to, you know, to do such a major change like this on the side of your desk. So I, I really think capacity is going to be a major issue. Uh, you know, we need to, we need to commit to a sustained um, resource piece to, to, to actually make this, this change. I don't think we can, we can overemphasize the the size of change that will be required in order to to actually go this next step. I know Sue talked about you know we've come a long way, but we also also have a long way to go, and I think that's the real part that really intrigues me and, and many of my colleagues is where do we go next? And and we have to liberate resources. We need to we need to actually have the capacity in order to think this. And I guess the only other thing that comes to mind quickly, Russ, is. Uh, you know the silos so we've got you know various silos in our organization and i think i think if we're looking at a change this big uh we need to break down those silos and we need to work together on a shared vision and uh, as i say uh have sustained commitment and attention for uh for this big change so i think those three things is what i think about in terms of um pieces we need to pay attention to going forward thanks dennis so in, in the last few minutes, or last minute really, I'll, I'll just turn to you, Scott. I mean, in, in the discussions that we saw, there was you know, many, many evidence of extreme events and unprecedented weather. I wonder how you see the role of climate change in your communications to your audience. What, what, uh, what, what do you feel that the understanding of climate change, what kind of products, and how, what influence do you think that will have over the products that you're providing to your clients in the future? The approach we're taking right now is from a storytelling standpoint, and you know it's more on the emotion side. So to to spurn people to action, uh, you have to reach them with a story. And we brought in Neil Osborne, who is uh, very well connected in the in the climate field. Uh, he's an exceptional uh, video journalist and storyteller. And so it's about telling the stories from other reaches of Canada, uh, whether it's the north, whether it's a farmer's perspective, a fisherman's perspective and how climate change is affecting their way of life. That's the approach we're taking. MSC does a great job with the data. On that one, we're looking more at the storytelling. 
Perfect. Thank you. So I think we've uh, we've come to the end of our session today. I, I really want to thank our panelists. I think this was an extraordinary session. At the beginning, we talked about putting putting this together about the coalition that, that addresses addresses climate uh, weather risk in Canada. And I think the success of that coalition is, is really built on collaboration and, and building expertise and a willingness to move forward together. Uh, I think from the evidence that we've seen so far, I think our coalition is, is in good shape. And I, I really look forward to sort of moving this forward collaboratively with, with the rest of you in the future. So thank you all very much and thank you to CMOS. Thank you. Thank you.